So I will start first today with some kind of like small questions. Um, so we can kind of like skip over that and then I will get into some linked topics because there are quite a few questions about reincarnation, previous lives, what happens in between lives. So I think that will be uh, the main topic for, uh, for today. Um, so um, uh, the first is kind of like a very small question. Uh, the question is about uh, Katie Byron. Is Katie Byron an example of a walk-in? She was very depressed and at the height of her depression she sh suddenly changes and did not recognize her own family. She even mentioned that she had to learn a lot about being human, etc. and that her personality changed too. And this is indeed a typical case of a person yeah, who, is, uh, who is a walk-in it's often a very um, similar story to people who are walk-ins. Often they're like at a point where their own spirit can't cope with it or can't continue growing or continue evolving. So then they hand their body to, uh, uh, to someone else. And I had a look at Katie Byron and you can see that there's a little bit of a break that the energies which were inhabiting her body when she was young are very different from the energies which are inhabiting her body today. And there's always a kind of a progression, a kind of a growth. But yeah, if the, if the change is very big, then this is often a, a, a sign that the, that the person is a, is a walk-in. Um, I see that someone else wants to join us, so I'll see if I can just add her. Because Lizzie has just joined. Okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah, uh, you didn't miss much. We just did one question. Um, so we have a lot of questions today, and I said already, like I can't answer all questions, but I'll just do a few uh, small ones. Uh, yes, and then I'll go a little bit into the story of reincarnation, previous lives, and because there's a lot of questions around that topic. Um, yes, okay. Um, so the other question is about um, traps and invasions of spirits who can take over a human body. So a hostile takeover rather than a walk-in, which is actually a friendly takeover. And um, that it reminded her of um, uh, a blessing she received. And, um, yeah, so this is actually one of the, the, the traps, you can say. Um, uh, often, if you want to work with an egregore or a religion or a master uh, or school, then they will ask you to, uh, yeah, to uh, become part of that religion, that uh, egregore or that master's teaching or path. And often this can be... Um, this alters the energy body and any good blessing or initiation should alter the energy body. But it also opens you up to spirit from that tradition or from that line uh, to move in. So it's always the opening of a door to a spirit group. And this, yeah, if your own spirit is very similar to it, then yeah, those spirits which you're now open to, they're your brothers and your sisters and they will help you along. But yeah, if you open up to a group which are like not so friendly to you, you can open yourself up to a hostile takeover. But as I said before, you you have your own life force, your own energy, which can help you to transform those energies and to clean it out. Uh, you can also go to another uh, spiritual teacher or master and ask them to remove your previous initiations or your previous blessings. And um, as I said before, like sometimes if there's an outstanding balance, the cost have to, has to be paid. Or if there's um, um, the need to, uh, uh, to close um, yeah, the account, then uh, you need some, sometimes a person with enough authority uh, to do that for you. 
Um, so now we want to get into a little bit of the, uh, the journey of the soul. Um, because there's quite a few Okay, so everybody who has a mic open, could you please close the mic because there's a bit of noise on the line. I hear it too, so... Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's quiet now. Um, so we want to um, I'll follow the, a bit the journey of the soul and then we can just go step by step and that should answer some of the questions. So basically the point for me where to start is at the enlightened soul. Um, because when we enter into our, our universe we're not yet bound to this universe. We often enter of our own free will or interest or desire to be in our, uh, our current universe. And um, when we are here um, we start to make connections to certain uh, flows of energy and uh, the first step we make is actually going from a state of cosmic enlightenment to a state of personal enlightenment and I want to talk a little bit about the, the difference here um, so cosmic enlightenment is basically the state where your spirit can connect to everything so uh, there is no fundamental difference in your experience between you and your body and somebody else and their body and so the experience the cat is having I see it as the same value and intensity as the spirit yeah which is experiencing my own body so this is basically the state of cosmic enlightenment that your consciousness can move um, in between all things so you can you are as much a planet as you are a mouse as you are a tree as you are a dog uh, there's really no uh, no threshold between where your consciousness is so you're everything and you're nothing at the same time um, and from this state of cosmic consciousness which is a very nice exploratory state but also a little bit of a powerless state you're really disidentified um, with everything you go into a state of personal um, enlightenment and the state of personal enlightenment is that you are still quite uh, quite free uh, you can move in and out of a body or a set of bodies but you kind of limit your interest and the realm of your consciousness uh, to either a solar system or a group of incarnations or a group of people or even just one incarnation. Um, in general though a spirit will have many different energy bodies it is working with at the same time. Um, so it's very common for an, uh, a spirit who's in a state of personal enlightenment to have like dozens of bodies which it is using and even many of them can be incarnated at the same time. Um, there was also stories about that in, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, how some lamas decide to incarnate in two separate bodies so they can teach more quickly and they can yeah, get more things done in the same time because they want to, of course, bring enlightenment to all beings, which is quite a big task. So if you can use more bodies to do so, that's quite useful. But of course, the permission to use those bodies has, been, has to be granted by other powers. Um, actually, from the state of personal enlightenment, um, you go to an unenlightened state. And the difference in that is that no longer is your own free will the only power which is guiding you. So a state of enlightenment, only power, only thing which influences you is your own free will. And as the moment you leave the state of enlightenment, you get connected to all other kinds of flows. So you get either into the light cosmos or into the dark cosmos or into uh, arimanic, luciferic, uh, uh, satanic or unfallen cosmoses. Um, and it is also uh, explained within uh, Buddhist philosophy 
that there are actually various um, attachments you have which cause inclinations. Um, so these are already a little bit the heavier attachments. Um, but it's quite interesting to, to go around them. Uh, so one of them is to have a dislike for something. So this is the attachment of, of anger or hatred or loathing. Um, because you basically what you do is you take sides. You say one thing is good, the other thing is bad. And as soon as you think that one thing is good, the other thing is bad, then you're going to fight or struggle or try to avoid or have some kind of a play with the opposite power. Um, so this is a very heavy attachment because um, you and your opposite are in a way completely intertwined. You will always meet, you will always find each other and play out your whole um, yeah, little uh, dislike game in the cosmos. Um, so this is a very heavy and very fundamental attachment which, which many people have. Um, the next attachment is that of, uh, of desire. So um, if you are in an energy body you can have some uh, experiences, but certain experiences are only possible in lower, lower bodies. And out of this desire to experience emotions, experience thoughts, experience memory, um, experience even pain or sickness or happiness, um, you try to find a body to experience it with. So this desire for experiences draws us also to, to bodies and to layers of manifestation where you can experience the things you seek to experience. So it is um, a hunger for experiences which also drives us to it. Um, something which can be a trap by being in a body is that you get used to it so you can uh, form a habit like okay I incarnated as a human before so I'm used to being a human and I will incarnate as a human again or as a dog or as a stone or I'm used to having a body so I want to have a body again. So this is kind of a, a habit forming which can also trap us and uh, to, to narrow our scope of incarnations. Um, Finally, we have curiosity. Uh, curiosity is, is actually the reason why most of us are human beings. Um, because we don't just want to experience something, but we actually want to develop some understanding about our own experiences. So it's a little bit yeah, combined with experiencing something, because without experience there's yeah, very little use of curiosity. But curiosity is really delving into matters, exploring matters, just not, not just experiencing them, but really going deeper, using your mind, using your thoughts, um, using your associative processes or inspirational processes. Um, then there is uh, the, the process of um, envy, um, of in a way having a, 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 a desire for power, or the desire to manifest power, to change things, to influence things, um, to be part of something, uh, not to be ignored, uh, to get attention. Um, this also causes incarnations, not necessarily physical incarnations. You can also incarnate as a, as a spirit who is also influencing things from their egregore, but also it brings you out of the state of enlightenment. Um, and finally, there is also the, um, the principle of um, choosing a duty. If you feel that um, uh, there is a task for you to be fulfilled, or there is a position which needs to be taken, like somebody needs to take, needs to take care of the planet, or to heal the sick, or to teach the unenlightened, then um, by identifying with a task, with a purpose, with a niche, you start to incarnate into that niche. Um, and actually for all these reasons we will start to leave our enlightened state and go into unenlightened states. And um, when we are in an unenlightened state we look for a place to, to work with yeah, whatever attachment we have formed. So we start looking for the right gods or goddesses, the right solar system, the right planet, the right life form, 
uh, to work with all these tendencies. And um, if you only have a very few very simple tendencies, so for instance you only have hunger, you only have desire, but you have no reason to comprehend something, you can turn into a parasitic larva or something. You can leech off some energies without understanding, without any... So you can turn into a very primitive life form. Um, but usually the more of these elements we have, the more entwined we get, but also the more complex the life forms we inhabit will be. So it's not by definition true that because as humans we are very complex beings that we're closer to enlightenment than for instance uh, a deer uh, or a cow. Um, all actually life forms can, uh, can reach enlightenment. Uh, it's not limited to human beings. But the essential thing for enlightenment is basically that not so much just the human consciousness um, changes its mind, but that the consciousness which inhabits us should be a reflection of our spirit. And um, if this is true, then changes in the consciousness will be changes in the spirit and we can reach enlightenment. So for the process of a spiritual growth, you really need to have kind of a, um, a harmony between the spirit inhabiting the body and the consciousness. And this is the very, very tricky thing in modern society. Um, because we have a lot of things which influence our consciousness, which are not coming from the spirit. We have the media, we have our society, we have culture, we have our own um, plans, um, our own goals in our lives, which are not necessarily coming from the spirit. Um, so this makes enlightenment a yeah, rather a daunting task. Um, but once these desires are there, um, it also means that no longer our own willpower is the essential part which is in control. Because these desires, whether we want them to or not, also start controlling our inclinations and our lives. So, for instance, if as a spirit, enlightened spirit, I form this desire like, okay, I want to be part of the cosmos of light and fight against darkness, then um, this desire takes an energetic shape, it becomes part of the energy body and that will yeah, uh, pull me into the cosmos of light and pull me to the border where the two cosmoses collide and there's friction between them and I find myself yeah, in the middle of this war zone and I can decide as a spirit like, oh gosh, this was a very silly thing to want or to desire, I don't want it anymore but uh, the desire has a life of its own and it will continue yeah, influencing me and reincarnating me and reshaping me into that path until yeah, my spirit again reaches this state of enlightenment and it manages to break down this, uh, this desire, this attachment which is pulling me into a more specific form. So every form of attachment in a way narrows your focus. Uh, but also allows you to go more deeply into things and um, to be more uh, a part of things. Um, and this doesn't mean that um, your own willpower disappears, but there are other powers there which are like sometimes controlled by your will, sometimes influenced by your will, but imperfectly. They have a life of their own. And um, if these powers become too strong, um, then we start losing our memory. Uh, so one of the questions I got for today is how can you remember your previous lives? And the thing is more like how did we forget our previous lives? How did we forget our spirit? And this is usually by all these other attachments becoming too strong and overwhelming the spirit. So the spirit remembers everything which yeah, it did and which it wants to do. But um, in a way the, the remembrance of the spirit um, requires also a lot of willpower in the spirit. It has to take responsibility to guide itself and not just to coast along. Because I could say, oh, okay, I want to be part of the cosmos of light, the cosmos of light will guide me, will 
take care of me, it will heal me, it will um, show me what to do, it, I will meet people from that same cosmos, so wherefore would I guide myself, wherefore would I make decisions, I can just follow. And as soon as this happens, as we in a way relinquish control or the spirit becomes overwhelmed by all these influences, then we start to lose our memories. So to maintain our memory, our spirit needs to be quite strong. And it also needs to have a kind of a discipline. It needs to recognize all its attachments, know they are there, but also it should be able to control them. It should say like, okay, I chose for instance to, to fight against the darkness, and now I will use my attachment to the cosmos of light to get some egregore to teach me or to inspire me to become a better fighter. Instead of that the cosmos of light is itself using me as a part of itself or transforming me into being just a part of itself. So we tend to lose ourselves by becoming part of all these greater energies, these greater flows. And only through strength and discipline of the spirit can we not forget. But yeah, it is quite a process if we've lost this memory to get it back again. And uh, one of the things you also see is that if you look at early humanity, like thousands of years ago, people tended to remember, they tended to know who they were in their previous lives. Uh, but as we incarnate more and more, more and more layers, more and more culture, more and more programming, uh, come on top of our spirit, so the load for our spirit to bear becomes heavier and heavier. So what you often see is also that spirits who have incarnated a lot, uh, yeah, quickly after one incarnation after another, their spirit becomes totally lost. And if you take more time between incarnations, the spirit has some time to digest everything which happened, to yeah, like detach a little bit and then they can incarnate with more clarity and it is often that by incarnating too quickly that we lose a lot of our, our memory in a way um, but we also get a lot of memory and this is rather paradoxical because if you incarnate very quickly from one life to the next there is an increased forgetfulness of the spirit because you take a lot of memories and energies from your previous incarnation into your present life so in a way you remember more of your previous incarnation but you remember less of your purpose because you're and you have less control over your life because it is even more overwhelmed by all the energies of your previous incarnation um, this is also one of the risks of going into regression therapy without proper guidance um, So, okay, the, there is a question here. Is there nobody to advise on, on this? Before the incarnation, the spirit guides, etc. Yes, but we tend not to listen. Um, this is usually the case when people reincarnate too quickly. Um, often people who incarnate very quickly, they often do so out of anger or out of frustration. Um, often they will have had a certain plan in their lives or a certain expectation for their lives. And if their lives turned out to be disappointing, or they died, or they failed, then they're like, damn it, I want to get it right. And just like a little child who's already too tired to do something, but doesn't want to go to bed because he's interested, in, uh, we tend to push ourselves. And we tend to push ourselves into the next incarnation if we fail, if we feel this frustration. And um, this is usually what goes wrong. Um, so in general, like, like the, the processes vary a lot, but in general you can say if a person incarnates again within like three years, then it's, it's yeah, usually too much of the heavy energy from his previous incarnation will just tag along to his next incarnation. And he will in a way be reliving uh, his or her life and will find often that there is a, a lot of lack of control from the spirit about that uh, incarnation. Um, so yes, we, uh, it, it's usually not so much that the system is very flawed, but it is basically our own uh, flaws, our own attachments, which become so strong that they drag us forward 
into new manifestations instead of allowing us to pause and take some time and to consider do I want to incarnate again or not. This is also one of the big hallmarks of uh, enlightenment that you can actually really choose as a spirit, use your own will to decide whether to incarnate or not and into what form. All these other attachments, they no longer control you, they no longer have power over you. So the question is, um, you know, what is the more practical way um, uh, to remember? And um, there we come to the concept of the long will. So the long will is actually a part of the energy body which can be seen by um, a psychic or a reader. And the long will is um, a structure, more or less um, at the location of the, of the second chakra. But um, it is not the second chakra, it's just um, slightly higher, it's more in the, in the Hara center. And it is a structure which is almost like a, uh, like a pillar, a column, uh, sticking out from the body. And uh, you can literally see the length of it, and by the length of it, it's, uh, uh, you can in a way see how strong is the willpower developed. So how strong is the desire uh, which the spirit is able to, to manifest. So how much control does the, the spirit have over its incarnations. So if the spirit is weak, the willpower of the spirit is weak, and the influences on the spirit are strong, it can't control its inclinations, it gets dragged along and because it is kind of like yeah, the, there's a scattering because in every life things happen and they just drag you into the next life and there is not one line to it so the, the experiences are very different and um, because there's no real relationship between all the lives or relationship between the lives and the spirit uh, it's often a life which is spent in confusion. Uh, the person is very confused what to do, what is the meaning of life, and um, the next life will be the same. So we're in a way like um, flotsam and jetsam, so plants floating on the water just going with the current. And we tend not to have memories. And if we start to develop the long will, so if we are able to devote ourselves to uh, to one thing and even have such a strong devotion that we're willing to devote ourselves for several lifetimes. So for instance I might be interested in martial arts and I can say like okay I'm interested in martial arts but I can take a course but I can also make it a lifestyle and not just for one life but I will keep my focus on it this is what is important to me and to my spirit and I will incarnate again and again and again and become a better and better and better master at martial arts. And if we do this, if our spirit becomes strong enough to, um, yeah, to, to guide us through several lines, then usually after you've incarnated four times with the same goal, with the same desire, all these lives and the memories of these lives tend to link together. So after four lifetimes you start to be born with a lot of talents. So you might not have a, a completely crystal clear memory of your spirit or of your previous lives, but the things which you have built up in your previous lives, they're harmonious enough, they're similar enough so they can connect to form one whole. It's a little bit like are you gathering pebbles, which in a way scatter if you, um, if you don't use a lot of force, or are you gathering clay now you're adding things together and sticking things together. So you need actually one stable structure in your spirit and you add to that over your lives. And this is using the long will. Okay, the risk when going to regression therapy was to get re-trapped in your attachment pattern, thus reinforcing it. Uh, yes, it, it can be a danger. 
Um, so uh, a good reg regression therapist will basically look at the journey of your spirit. Like, um, what is it that your spirit is trying to achieve? How did your spirit get trapped in your previous incarnations? And how to liberate it from all the traps and attachments to the previous incarnations? So the, uh, the goal of a, of a good regression therapist is to free your spirit from all the past lives and also to discover a little bit like why are you incarnating and how can your current life be as close to the desires of your spirit as possible because these previous incarnations they can hold hints and information about the desire and the nature of your spiritual being so this is what a good regression therapist does a poor regression therapist gets you trapped in your previous life so they will tell you like gosh in a previous life you used to be a priest to Osiris so gosh you have the talent and the power uh, why don't you do that again in this life or uh, and people start by bringing up and reviving these attachments they get reattached and then also the current life starts to be influenced by the previous life instead of of being influenced by the spirit, which should be the one in control. Um, so the quality of the regression therapist is very important. And the groups, often good regression therapists, they also use astrology to look at your moment of birth, because this is often an indication very much of the desires of the spirit, because the spirit is often like trying to, to find an incarnation which is as close as possible to its own nature rather than to its program nature. So this is one of the things which are still influenced quite strongly by the spirit and not only by the desire to reincarnate which is dragging you along. And there are often many hints there uh, which a good uh, astrologer slash regression therapist can pick up on and then uh, focus on helping you um, work with those issues and to uh, liberate your spirit again. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, where to find a um, person <laughs> to, who is a good regression therapist? <laughs> well, that's a very practical question. Um, uh, in the Netherlands there is actually a, a, a society um, um, so who have registered therapists who are actually um, generally quite good at, uh, at their jobs. Um, so I took regression sessions uh, myself actually with several therapists, some of them were better than others. Um, the one I liked best, she was also a developmental psychologist. Um, unfortunately she's not working anymore, so yeah, I'm too bad. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the memories of the previous lives, it's very important in a way that um, you view them from the perspective of your spirit and not from the perspective of your attachment. Um, so often it is our, um, uh, the unfinished things, um, our frustrations in a way, which um, go from life to life. So if in the previous life I failed, then in my current life I will have that as a, as a desire or as a, an anger or an allergy. And um, often if we find that our lives are being controlled by these subconscious tendencies, looking at our previous incarnations can really help to find out where they came from and to put them where they should be, namely resolve them outside of your current incarnation. Because otherwise your current incarnation is actually turning into... Uh, reliving the past so any unresolved problem I will recreate in my current life hoping to resolve it but that can also be still be unresolved because it's very strange where does it come from I don't understand why is this happening to me because it's coming from previous life and then it turns into a next even bigger unresolved conflict which will yeah, then move on to my next incarnation so cleaning up incarnations and not just on your personal incarnation, but also the karma of your bloodline. It's really a very necessary maintenance work you need to do 
uh, to keep incarnating on this planet um, a pleasure both for yourself and for other spirits and for your children and uh, people who come after you. Um, and it's also very important to um, not to over identify because in a way of course in the previous life you were angry at whoever committed the crime against you or you feel bad about whoever you harmed um, but ultimately you have to be able to say like okay I need to get over that my spirit has experienced that it needs to absorb this experience take from it learn from it what it can and leave the rest behind and this can seem unpersonal, callous, unemotional, and it is. But it is also what needs to be done in a way. If you want to you not get dragged down by your emotions, by your guilt, by your patterns. You have to sometimes say like, okay, that's a pattern, it's very bad, it's emotional. But also I have to focus on the higher, I have to focus on the part of me which is still clear, which is still pure, and reinforce that. Uh, because by reinforcing it you can prevent it from reoccurring of again getting dragged in by your emotions and your lack of judgment so prevention is much more important than reliving or remembering um. okay mm. So now we got a little bit to um, um, we are really the interesting process of actually how um, how we incarnate. So um, the first the thing we actually bring into our solar system um, is a desire to work with certain elements, with certain forces which are present within our solar system. And um, each of these elements has um, a deity, a god or a goddess, or a planetary spirit governing this energy. And in a way we are um, becoming a cell within their energetic bodies. So they are sharing their incarnation with us. So in a way um, I am as I am here. Uh, my energy body is composed of solar energy, of earth energy, of moon energy and lots of other planetary and um, celestial energies and um, the Sun and all the planets have an influence on that they can influence it directly but they're also saying like okay we can share the influence like I can control your body but you can also control your body and these energies and we can work together we can guide this energy together and this way by me guiding you at times I can show you things I can teach you things and by you taking control, you can also enrich my life and my experience by taking guidance. So in a way it's very much of a symbiotic relationship with all the gods and goddesses and powers and things. So it's important to remember that even though we think that we are alone and we are the only power in control of our yeah, existence, we are not. We are actually sharing. And at difficult times we can also relinquish control and go back to the god and the goddess and say like I'm confused, I don't know how to do this, can you show me how it, it's, how it is done and then try to learn from that. So it's not about relinquishing responsibility but it is about like trying to learn. Um, an example for, for me is like I'm never been yeah, very uh, talented at, uh, at manifesting money. Um, so a few months ago I basically yeah, prayed to, to the goddess of, of money and said like gosh I know you like me and we have a good relationship but yeah I'm not getting it. <laughs> and since then I've had a lot of um, well good fortunes happening so unexpected tax returns and actually today somebody I met 10 years ago who I borrowed money has contacted me again with an offer like gosh I borrowed some money from you 10 years I moved to another country but I would like to repay you and yeah and I have to say honestly it is still a little bit confusing to me how actually this goddess is changing this money energy in me but I should pay attention to it and learn from it so I can learn how to do that myself.
So um, the uh, next uh, phase is after you've in a way found the, the powers you want to, to form a manifestation of and you've made a kind of an agreement with them um, that you uh, join a collective consciousness and find the, the, the life patterns which are possible within that. So for instance the possibilities which are open to a pig are different than the possibilities which are open to a dolphin or a stone or a human. And um, ultimately your spirit wants to transform, so it wants to uh, go for a set or series of incarnations which are suitable to it. So it will choose a life form where it can experience the things which it uh, desires or to have the transformation it desires or to affect the universe in the way it desires. And um, Sometimes even people will um, incarnate in, in several bodies to help themselves. So I've had one case actually where the same spirit incarnated into the man and into his dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> and yeah, of course the relationship between the man and the dog was very intense. But also if the dog died, then the spirit would, which was in the dog or the part of the spirit of the man which was in the dog would reincarnate in the next dog he would have. So he had three dogs which were in a way basically copies of himself in, in next bodies. And in this way he would be in a way talking to himself, working with himself, stabilizing himself and yeah, improving uh, his incarnation. Uh, this is a very extreme example of a, a spirit which was very powerful, which had a lot of control over its incarnations and over its guidance. So this is more for people who are spiritually very advanced, but these are definitely the possibilities. Um, so the next uh, phase to get into is after you've selected the species, is to select the, the archetypal path. So uh, if you go into Jungian psychology, there's a lot of stories there about the maiden, the hero, uh, uh, the crone, um, uh, the fool, the magician. Um, and these are all uh, patterns you can, uh, you can live, you can uh, transform yourself by different paths. So you can also use the tarot, the, the, the uh, 22 cards of the, of the major arcana. There are also different paths of, uh, of incarnation, of uh, reshaping yourself. There's also a lot of fairy tales and myths are also indications of the paths you can take as a human. Um, and it is important in a way to, uh, to remember uh, these things, to remember um, what is the purpose of your life, what is the spiritual story of your life. And these are always like yeah, found in psychology, in mythology, in fairy tales, in folklore, in spiritual teachings. And um, all these stories, they actually uh, act as a reminder to keep our spirit awake so that we also keep on track and we don't get lost by all our desires and attachments to them. So once we have a species, then we also have a path, then we start to develop a personality. And uh, the personality structure uh, is something we tend to take a lot of time to, uh, uh, to create. Um, personality structure is uh, often like partially created, partially borrowed. So the spirit starts to look for examples, other persons who walked a similar path, who are your idols in a way and um, by following these people around, sometimes acting as a spirit guide to other people, we prepare ourselves and we also see what qualities work or don't work. And we start to, to copy certain things like, gosh, I would like to be brave or I would like to be smart or I would like to be stubborn or I would like to be very fiery. Uh, and we start to gather personality structures which we feel are both in a way reflecting our spirit but are also good tools to manifest ourselves on the planet. And um, once this um, yeah, uh, personality structure becomes stronger 
we actually move from the, the level of the higher astral where in which we are more guides or in a way a little bit depersonalized we become more individualized we start to identify more with our thoughts with our feelings with our tendencies Okay, um, so the, uh, the next phase is actually of, uh, if we develop this personality, um, we uh, start to look for a place to be born. And the place to be born is actually in uh, a very complex uh, matter. So uh, step one is actually uh, uh, contacting because in our solar system we have karma, this is not true for all solar systems, but uh, karma is very much um, um, about tendency, like what is your tendency, what is your nature, and they will try to find a body which is suitable to your nature and a circumstance which is suitable to your nature. If you like to fight, you will be born in a place where there is much fighting. If you like to be at peace, then you will be born in a place where there is a lot of peace. And um, also the uh, complexity or amount of powers which you can handle well. So it is very much the, uh, the quality of the control you've shown in the past which uh, determines if you are granted a certain power again. Um, for instance, if I am made, uh, if I am given a tremendously powerful and strong physical body. Well, and if in the previous life I tend to get drunk and I kill people when I'm drunk and I kill people when I'm drunk and driving and um, I uh, break my, uh, my son's back because I slap him too hard and yeah, then they will say like, gosh, you're really not in control of your physical strength and you're just creating a lot of problems and... The, what you manifest is not the desire of your spirit to manifest so it's better that you don't manifest and you don't get it um, so often um, such powers will be given to people who have at least in previous incarnations had some skill at working with it um, so in my case I've spent a few lives as a shaman and well they say like okay well you did okay with your working with your energy body and with spirit so we will trust you to do okay again if you get this power in your current incarnation so it's kind of a level of trust which you build up uh, it's also important to note that it is not about um, in a way a judgment so if i um, have these spiritual powers and I use it to make people sick and to curse them and to kill them and to create all kinds of disasters but it is my desire to do so and I do it in a very skillful way then I will still be born with that power um, so it is about the level of skill about the level of control it is not about good or evil uh, when it comes to the judgment of karma uh, it is just what is a good tool for you and you are given tools which you can use and you are given some tools which you can learn to use but you are generally not given something which is utterly confusing so um, when we have um, um, uh, gotten permission from the Lords of Karma um, then you start to look for um, what kind of elemental energies would go well with you so these are the, the elements of uh, earth, water, air and fire. Um, so two elements are by nature giving you structure, air and earth, and the other two are by nature creating movement, water and fire. And um, if you have these, these elements, then you start to look basically for, uh, for a parentage, uh, a bloodline to be born into. Because uh, generally you will people try to find a bloodline where those powers are already there 
these elemental energies are already in the bloodline. Um, if you uh, find that, then of course you have to look at like what type of uh, forming or shaping will I get from my parents? How will they form my personality and is that to my liking? And in my case I had basically three sets of parents to choose from. And yeah, you pick one which seems best to you at that time. And you try to find a place and uh, a time to be born where actually the energies, because at that time you have to, in a way, transform what is just an astral energy into an incarnated personality. So you have to, in a way, transform what is already existing into a seed, which is implanted in the, yeah, uh, in the in the in the fetus, in the in the in the baby's body at the moment of birth, which will grow up into a copy of the spirit. And to create this seed, you need actually the spirit needs to gather the energies, which are available at the moment of birth or at the moment it enters into the body. And during the first couple of years of life, usually the first four years, the spirit will also leave the body to try to gather some more energies, to yeah reform or to to shape and to make this seed more powerful, more strong, and to fine tune it a little bit, depending on the circumstance. So basically the first four years of your life, uh, they really de yeah, determine the type of uh, potential you have in, your, in, your, uh, in, your, in the rest of your incarnation. And the rest of the time you, uh, the spirit is usually bound to the body, so it can't go easily out again. Uh, although it is possible with trans journeying, but for most people it is not possible for them to leave to gather new energies, to really reshape and to reform their personality anymore. And so personality can transform, but it's a rather slow and difficult process, often doesn't work. But during the first couple of years of life, it's still very possible to do so. And it's usually only after the personality is totally yeah, crystallized that you're really stuck with it. But there's a lot of time to work a little bit and to, to adjust a little bit. Um, okay, let's see if there's more questions. Um, so yeah, I spoke a little bit about the deities and our relationship with them. Um, but also in relationship with the different cosmoses. Um, what you, you find is actually that every cosmos, so whether it's Arimanic, Luciferic, Satanic or Unfallen, uh, has its own set of deities. Um, so certain deities are not restricted to one cosmos. So for instance, um, um, there are like planets or solar systems which in a way are manifesting themselves in all cosmoses. But many of the gods and powers, they're actually related to, to one cosmos. And uh, that often also creates a, a little bit of a, a weird power struggle. Um, so for instance, if we, um, or an awkwardness. So for instance, if we look at, at money, which I talked about earlier, uh, money actually, and the, the gods of money, uh, they actually originated from the satanic cosmos, from the cosmos of nature. And they try to teach us patience, they try to teach us balance, uh, they try to teach us awareness of energy, and they existed long before, in a way, physical money existed. And the first forms of money were basically essential foodstuffs, so uh, uh, salt, uh, was, uh, 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 grain, uh, uh, they were often used as currencies. Um, and yeah, so of course if you have a handful of grain you can eat it all, but then you have nothing to sow, but if you sow it you get a harvest which is a hundred times more than you sow, but yeah, so it helps you to plan ahead to, to manage power and energy in as responsible and conscious way as possible. And thereby, yeah, you create a better harmony and better working together, greater symbiosis between all things. So this is also like kind of like what was the game of money, but 
uh, money became a tool later for uh, powers of the Arimani cosmos who say like power is money, money is power and by using money I can exert power, I can raise armies, I can uh, bribe people and in a way, yeah, of course the gods and goddesses of money are just shocked and appalled at how something they created is like go is being torn away from their control. Um, and so this makes it very confusing. Uh, so if you're from an Aramanic yeah, perspective, then uh, there is not a god or a goddess of money in our current solar system. There's just you and the power and the energy of the money which you which you use. There's no real guidance into how to use it in the best way or most proper way according to your way of thinking. So not everything everything which exists has a god or a goddess attached to it, but not everything which exists has a god or a goddess attached to it within your cosmos. So that makes it rather a, a tricky thing sometimes. So sometimes you have to skip cosmoses to, to look at things. So um, many things also don't exist in the nature cosmos, but they do exist in the uh, Luciferical cosmos, for instance. So sometimes to understand something, you have to leave your own cosmos. Because otherwise it just remains a mystery to you. Because you can't get in touch with the essence of the thing. Um, so that's about the relation between gods and cosmoses. Um, okay, yeah, so there's also um, a question here about um, when people are ill. When people are ill, um, yeah, um, yeah, it's been observed that a lot of family members and a lot of spirit help will come to visit them, will come to be with them. And what exactly is the, is the process? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Does it cost energy? Does it give energy? And the answer is it, it can be many different things. Um, so one of the things which, which happen is that um, if a person dies, they still are a personality. They still have emotions. They still have feelings. They still have love. They still care for their children or their loved ones. And they don't want them to suffer. Um, so one of the things which can happen if a person is miserable, is in pain, um, that actually the um, yeah their friends and family will come to in a way uh, kill them. Uh, so they want to help them to take away the suffering, to take them to a higher world, to a better world where they are living. Um, so and in that case the the presence of the family members will in a way yeah, drain the life force and they will help the person to leave their body and step over and be without fear of death because they're there to take care of them and yeah they take them out of this life of this existence into the next existence uh, this is one of the things which can happen um, two other things can also happen one of them is that the other guides they come to um, a lower level to manifest their, their wishing power. So for instance if uh, I'm not feeling too well and my grandfather is worried about me and he wants me to get strong and healthy again, um, by coming closer to me he's closer to actually where the problem is and he can affect those layers of energy more strongly and he can then in a way form an image of like a healthy energy body and uh, in a way it's like a magnet so he's trying to pull my energy body towards a certain state by creating a healthy energy body by by wishing it to exist and in a way my own energy body will become kind of a mix between what is my own tendency and what is the wished for tendency and um, especially if you have a lot of yeah beings human beings or spiritual beings wishing the same thing, the power of such a wish can become quite strong. And this is often how miracles are actually worked or prayer healings function. Because if the image becomes stronger than the real one, then the real one, the real energy body will in a way adapt to, to the stronger power, to the stronger energy. 
So there's a kind of a threshold which needs to be passed. And if the wishing power is strong enough, then it will come true. If the wishing power is too weak, it will only have a small influence or it will twist things a little bit, but not. it won't break the pattern. But this is one of the things how indeed spirits help us continuously and even more so when uh, we're really in trouble or we're, when we're really in need. Um, another reason for family members to show up is also to instruct and to give help to a person's personal guides. Because often your own guides have not had experience with being incorporated and by receiving instruction from the family members they can be taught how to heal a physical body. And um, there are also instances where a family members who passed on, they've retained some life force or some energy or gathered some life force or energy, often through rituals or prayers or the ceremonies which are done for the ancestors or the protectors of the tribe or the nation or the city which you live in and this energy can then be yeah, given back so it comes from the physical world so it contains this life force and it can then be given back to the physical world so in a way if I perform a healing ceremony for somebody and here I sacrifice some fruit or uh, some herbs and I burn some incense, this life force which is sacrificed here can be taken by a spirit which can then go to the sick person and reinfuse that life force into the sick person. Okay, uh, so there is a question to go back a little bit to the choosing of parents. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting concept. So uh, often what you do is you... Um, often there is a kind of a, a, a linkage um, to the, the attachments which you still have from your previous lives and your parents. Because often you use your parents to work with to the garbage which is left over from your previous life. So for instance, if I have a feeling of guilt, like gosh I did not accomplish my mission, then I will choose a parent who will make me feel guilty and I'm never good enough and I'm always too slow or too weak or too stupid or what and whatsoever. So in a way, often the parents, they remanifest our traumas from our previous incarnations. And it may seem a little bit masochistic to, uh, to do so. It's just like, why, why, why? Well, we need to get rid of it. Uh, we need to work through it to actually re-reach uh, our spiritual consciousness. So our parents are, in a way, our, um, our teachers who manifest uh, the things which we did wrong in our previous lives. So often our parents are not so much the example of how to do it, but can also be the example of how not to do it. <laughs> but in both ways, either they're a positive or a negative example, but often there are, their nature is very much reflecting issues which we feel very strongly about from our previous incarnations. Um, and sometimes it goes well, as I said, then we we see through it and our, we, we find that, gosh, I want, don't want to be trapped in this feeling of blaming other people all the time or not feeling good enough and apologizing all the time. And then our spirit takes control of it and says, like, gosh, if I want to motivate myself and push myself, I can guilt trip myself. Or if I'm going to push somebody else, I can make them feel that they're not good enough and force them to, to work harder on themselves, to motivate them then your spirit can start to use it as a tool instead of being trapped by it. This is the positive outcome, but sometimes you also have a negative outcome because it's always risky and you become even more trapped in the pattern. But yeah, it is always uh, with that reason that we, uh, that we tend to choose our parents uh, to work on those, uh, on those issues. Um,
Ah, yes. There is also the experience that we come to teach our parents, but they do not listen. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> um, yes, it's, um, it's very much a, generally a double thing. Um, because the, the thing we want to, to work on is actually, uh, usually you try to, to achieve a, a, a mutual enlightenment. Uh, so you want to work on an issue, but you also want to the other person to work on the issue, so that ideally both of you will understand the proper relationship to that issue. So, for instance, um, guilt and duty, you want yourself to understand what is the proper way to, to work with those energies, and you want also the other people to understand, to share your lesson or your insight with them. Um, doesn't always work out. Um, often it's also complicated because there are powers which want us to grow and there are powers which want to block our growth or to prevent us from changing the world or altering their game. Um, because in a way, um, as I said, we can be, um, from the positive side, share an incarnation, but in the bad side, if our own spirit is too weak, then we become pawns, we become slaves to, to another power and they don't want our spirits to awaken, they want to use us as slaves, they want to use our bodies, our life force to, for their own goals and any process of awakening in a way yeah, can awaken these dark powers, dark egregores, dark spirits who are like no, you're not going to steal my slave, it's quite the opposite, you're going to be my slave as well and yeah, so things can get turned around, and this is always the risk. Okay. So it's often um, very much also, like if I speak from my own life, I also had the desire to teach my parents a few things and hoping that they would stay together and they would, they have a lot of differences and tensions and different patterns, but that they would learn about love and working together and synergy and they could work things out. But basically when my parents were about two years old, they moved into a house which was very um, uh, full with, uh, uh, yeah, with spirits which were not very uh, friendly. So they aggravated the problems, they decreased my power and tied me up with lots of other things. So things didn't work out as planned. Um, it's how things go, it's always a risk, it's always... Um, it's not only your own power and your own guides who influence things, but there are also other powers who also have desires. And um, some things go smoothly, some things they don't go smoothly. But the important thing to remember is your spirit cannot be destroyed. And if your willpower is strong enough, it doesn't matter. If you fail in this incarnation, you take another incarnation. If you fail in that incarnation, you take another incarnation. You have unlimited amount of time to reach your goals. Uh, the only time you lose is when you stop trying to reach your goals, when you become too distracted or you give up. And this is the real victory for these other powers. Hmm. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about the process of, of yeah, being born and also the, the influence uh, of other spirits when you're sick. Um, and this is also very much of the collective you're born into. And in Western Europe it's, it's not that strong, but for instance if you go to, to Asia, where people still pray to their ancestors, and um, also uh, the Americas, where also this is still done, uh, or to Africa, where people yes, still have greater tribal spirits who take care of nations and of people. Um, yeah, these spirits can go quite strong and they can really have a very powerful impact. Um, but it's also the consciousness with which they live and die. 
which allows this to happen. So for instance, if um, a person in China dies, he knows that his next job will be to take care of his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and he will not take incarnation because he has a job to do. And maybe he will incarnate at a certain time, but he will probably incarnate within that same family to also help that family again. And then when he dies, he will just continue his job of still taking care of the same family. So certain powers in families can become really, really powerful, really strong there, because they're nurtured and grown and perfected over many incarnations. And in a way this takes away an amount of freedom, because these um, yeah, ancestral spirits guide us. Um, but yeah, they also can, can teach us a lot, they can provide healing, they can provide protection, they can provide inspiration and a lot of stability because you're rooted in a very strong family line. And here in the West we don't have that as much, we are much more individualized. And we do see that as our individualized lifestyle is spreading from North America and Western Europe, also uh, these spirits who had these jobs in Asia and in Africa, they are now in a way giving up because they're tribal structure and family structures are becoming disrupted and destroyed by increasing um, individuality. So it is a resource which we still have, uh, but it is in a way not renewed as much, it's dwindling a little bit. Uh, but there are also always ancient cultures who still had those practices. Um, so for instance if you go to ancient Celtic sites you can still meet those greater protective spirits and also if you look at certain noble families or royal families who also uh, often incarnated spirits who wanted to take care of a people or to take care of a land certain of these noble lines they still also have these great protective spirits within them who still hang around to in a way try to take care of their countries but they cannot do so by incarnating as a king anymore they yeah, or a little bit sidelined a bit by our political processes, unfortunately. But yeah, they can definitely inspire us and they should, in a way, also act as a sort of inspiration to politicians and other leaders in how to uh, lead their countries well. Uh, a great example for, of that is Saint Stephen, I believe, who was uh, the king of Hungary, who in a way Christianized the country and uh, he sainted and his relics are still kept in the cathedral in Budapest and he is still very actively trying to heal his people to uh, purge them from all their sins from all their um, yeah how they got lost in a way and how they got lost as people as a nation um, it's a very hard job he has to do, but he's still very much trying to do it and it's a spirit I respect very much for still doing that all these hundreds of years. So if you get the chance to go to Budapest and see his shrine, uh, it's a perfect example of an ancestral spirit, a greater ancestral spirit. It's not just taking care of his line as he used to, but also really of his people. Um, hmm. So, um, about ancestors, the, um, yes, you can also invite them. Um, so, um, if a person is sick, you can also definitely, or in trouble, you can definitely try to talk to their ancestors, to try to get their uh, assistance in the, in the process, to try to protect them. Um, what is best is, of course, if you can guide the person to talk to their own ancestors. Uh, but the other major essential thing which is needed is life force. Because often these ancestors having been dead for a long time, they go to higher realms and they need heavy energies to, in a way, pull them back down to the world. So you, in a way, need to create a ladder for them in a ritual. So they can come from whatever level of consciousness they have achieved back down to our current level of consciousness uh, to work with us. So we of course have to try to go up, but we also have to help them to come down. And there are many beautiful rituals to, uh, to do this. And as I said before in any ritual, make sure there is enough energy and pure enough energy. Um. 
Okay. So yeah, there's uh, one more question indeed about the, the, the ancestors taking care of us. Uh, it's a nature cosmos thing and uh, yes, this is one of the possibilities, but it can also be an Aramanic cosmos thing. Um, in general, people who are very attuned to the divine cosmos, they tend not to form enough attachment to their family or to their country. It's just like if an angel instructs them to take care of a family or a child or their country, they will do so, but they have no internal inclination to, to do this. But people from the nature cosmos have this quite strongly. But also in the Arimanic cosmos, people identify with whatever they see as their responsibility or the part they have power over. So most of these ancestral spirits who cling to the jobs are from Arimanic or nature cosmos. Um, ah, there's just a personal question, <laughs> what kinds of, uh, okay, I'll just type this. Um, Well, let's have a look. Oh yeah, um, okay, this is the last question I will answer today because we're already running pretty late. Um, it is about the process of deincarnation. Uh, exactly in what order does it go and any yeah, important hints if you're guiding a person through it. Um, so um, one of the often held misconceptions is that actually you die because the life force runs out or stops. Um, what you see actually if a person dies is actually that the life force actually becomes stronger, which is very weird if, you, uh, if you're yeah, seeing that for the first time. Because uh, the life force is in a way um, dosed out, it is controlled by, by the spirit inhabiting the body. It's harmonized, so this life force should go there with this speed. That the moment that the spirit leaves the body, the life force is uncontrolled, so it kind of explodes. And so it just flows out very strongly and then fades away. It's like a going supernova, the sun it's dying, 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 and it gives a last big shudder, life force flies away, and then it's gone. Um, so the, the body of, of life force energy is actually not the, uh, the first to decay, but it is definitely one of the ones which decays quite, quite rapidly. Often within a day, at most within two or three days, then the total life force body will, will have decayed. Um, but the first thing which actually disappears is the etherical body and this is basically what links in a way the, the life force to the spirit and the etherical layer can be felt around the body it is basically often mistaken for an aura because it, it floats about usually about two inches above the physical body you, can, you have the etherical, the etherical body of the physical uh, etherical double, double you can feel it at about this distance and this is actually <coughs> the first thing to decay so it's basically a detachment between the energies which are on a physical level and the energies which are on a, on a spiritual level and the energies on the physical level thereby also become uh, inaccessible for, uh, for the spirit and um, a lot of things which are in a way uh, left behind or degrade very quickly are the memories and this is often very confusing uh, because people identify with their memories. It's like um, we tend to define ourselves that way, like, um, who are you? Well, I'm a programmer, I'm a doctor, or I'm a, I'm a cook. <laughs> and uh, why? Well, because I know how to cook, I know how to heal, I know... And uh, yeah, you can imagine that if these things would stick to you, it would be pretty much impossible to just have a, have a normal next incarnation. 
Um, so all these yeah, levels of knowledge and levels of identification um, they degrade almost instantaneously after after death. So you uh, forget your role, if you will, because in a way the spirit is just playing a role. It is role playing. It is saying like, gosh, in this life I would like to be a cook or a doctor or um, a, a computer programmer, and um, then it remembers like, oh, it was. Yeah, the game is over now, I want to play something else now, so I stop being a doctor or computer programmer. And all the memories and associations and things which go with it, they degrade, and almost at the instant of death. And this can be a very confusing thing if the person is identified with them. And often this creates a lot of panic. If the person is more spiritual, they will know that's not them, that's not their essence. But yeah, for an unconscious person it can be very confusing and sometimes spirits will start to wander to get it back. I find quite a few wandering spirits who were unwilling and unable to move on because they were looking for their role in life again. They were looking to be a part of the physical world again, uh, to recapture their, their lives which they had lost. And this is something which can never happen unless they actually take over another in physical body or something like that, so best not to get stuck into uh, any patterns of a similar nature. Um, so, but after that has happened, um, then you're still, um, you still have your emotional body, so you still have your attachment to your family and your cat and your house and other things, so that still remains within, uh, within the spirit after incarnation. And this is a more slow process of, uh, of letting go. Um, you do find that, uh, especially in the first days after death, these emotions are, uh, because they're the only things which remain in a way, because all the other roles and ways of acting have disappeared, and so people tend to act out very emotionally. They want to show their love or their anger, so often the spirit will manifest itself into breaking things or into dreams or into other messages to, 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 to manifest what emotion is still there but by doing it they also use up their emotional energy and in a way all the things which you wanted to say on an emotional level at a certain time they have been said the message has been received and um, this is really when we start our, our journey um, so after all these things have been done, and this is usually in the first week after the physical body has stopped functioning, this is when we really start to meet up with our guides, with our um, uh, passed on family members and friends who are there to help us to move on. And um, this usually takes the place of going into, yeah, you could say, a hospital. Um, because in a way for a, a human being, or uh, for a spirit, being a human being is like a disease. Um, you're not healthy as a spirit because you're infected with all kinds of thoughts, with all kinds of identifications, with all kinds of emotions, and this infection needs to be cured so that you can become a healthy spirit again. Um, so you're taken to a hospital where they teach you and cleanse you to get rid of all these things which are still clinging from you, from your previous incarnation and if before this period of cleansing and healing has been finished you re reincarnate again it can be problematic and the time spent in this astral hospital it's usually uh, several years in, in, in earthly time and people can go out of the hospital it's a voluntary hospital you don't have to stay there um, but it helps you to remember yourself as a spirit and to remember what's did you take the incarnation for? What did you want to achieve? So you can get clear again and make a clear decision instead of still make a decision to reincarnate again while still half caught up in your previous incarnation and in your experiences. And this can take up to 20 years I've seen for persons who are very strongly identified and as little as six or seven years for persons who are already much more aware and people who are like very spiritual, very holy, very connected to a certain egregore or purpose, they can do it almost immediately because 
for them, in a way, their personality, their emotions do not exist. Only their mission exists, only their inspiration exists, only God or the angel or the saint they follow exists. And if you're already that pure or that clear, you can reconnect very quickly again without confusion. Okay. Um, so um, after the time in the in the astral hospital, um, it is usually uh, the time where you get um, reassessed on a on a karmic level. Um, so on a karmic level they will in a way give you options like okay like you messed up totally your incarnation so you won't be given another incarnation because it's just wasted on you or you did quite well and you could reincarnate again or yeah so there's a little assessment phase going on like how well did you do how well did you score and into what group or flow should you be deposited next so this is partly free will because you might you want to go in a certain direction and depending on your desire and your skill they look for a suitable yeah a new form for you to take and it's very popular for people who have incarnated to spend some time as guides just to work through the lessons a little bit preparing for the next incarnation so often there can be, yeah, there's quite a lot of time between incarnations, usually several generations. Um, but if a person is very much devoted to a specific purpose or a specific egregore, then, yeah, there is not so much of a personal will how to do it well. They just go to where the work is. And if the work needs to be done soon, they will do, they will reincarnate. If yeah, there's enough people incarnated, they will stay in the egregore on a higher level. Um, so often, also after, the, in a way, the healing has happened, uh, people reintegrate into the egregore before reincarnating again. And uh, if you're part of several egregores, you can also um, visit them. But um, often you will find that there is like one major egregore uh, who will inspire your next incarnation and the other egregores which are friendly to you um, yeah they remember your friendship with them and they will help you again in your in your next incarnation but they won't be your major inspirational egregore so mainly people have like one egregore uh, and possibly also their the egregores which are very close to that egregore or cooperating a lot with that egregore which they will be uh, working with and of course, if you uh, become a great master like Vladimir, you start to transcend the egregores. And anyway, if you start to move towards enlightenment, you start to transcend the egregores. So you don't go back into an egregore necessarily, but you go back more uh, towards the collective consciousness, to working directly with the gods instead of working with the egregore, which is inspired by the different gods and deities. And ultimately, of course, if you um, choose to, you start to work with angels instead of gods. So then, instead of learning how to manifest or how to work with one fragment of the world, uh, which is basically, it doesn't have a purpose except developing your skill, um, you start to work much more with the divine will. Um, and of course, even if you follow the divine will, you still have to develop the skills, so you always have to go back to working with the energies and the gods who teach you how to work with those energies in one form or another. But then they are more serving also the angel or the divine spirit which is guiding you. Uh, together you're both servants of that same angel, instead of that you are serving the god who is serving the angel. So it becomes a more and more direct connection of your incarnation. If you want to go that way towards enlightenment, that is. Okay, well, my throat is kind of hoarse from all the talking. <laughs> um, we've talked for a long time. I will just pause for a few minutes to see if there's any questions. And there are still a lot of questions, or some questions, open for next week. Um, but I also have to warn you that I will be traveling to Russia 
Um, so between the 7th and the 23rd of December I won't be teaching. But after that I hope to uh, speak to you again. But we still have next week anyway. <laughs> okay. Secret <laughs> and thank you all. <laughs> okay, well, I'll um, uh, also post the still remaining questions which are left over from uh, from this week, and then maybe yeah, some more questions can be added for uh, for next week's uh, lesson. Okay, have a good evening. Bye bye.